Woo-hoo. People are always asking this question. How can I open up the door for Hashem's blessings a little wider? They the blessings come down more, faster, not just the door of Hashem, but how can I open up my own doors? That I should really feel good and be able to invest myself fully in what Hashem wants me to do. And how do we open the door for Parnassah, that income should be more abundant, and there are our children, we should have nachas from our children. How do we open up all these doors? So one of the... Uh, one amazing thing is our trust in Hashem. Trust in Hashem is an amazing thing. The trust in Hashem opens the door wider. That's true. But I want to talk about tonight about something else, which is discussed in the Sixth Torah portion, and that is the idea of Mida connected Mida. Hashem responds to us in a way of measure for measure. Gemara says in the Sixth Torah portion how Miriam and Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, Miriam and Aaron rather, had a discussion about Moshe Rabbeinu. They were discussing how is it possible that Moshe Rabbeinu uh, was allowed to separate from his wife. They didn't know that Hashem commanded him to separate from his wife because he was meant to talk to Hashem at all times. But they were talking about him and on their level, this wasn't considered to be something which was positive. And as a result of their talking negatively about Moshe Rabbeinu, they were smitten with this disease called Saras. They had this disease, Hashem spoke to them and rebuked them, and Hashem said to them, how can you speak about Moshe Rabbeinu, with Tzmunas Hashem Yabit, Moshe Rabbeinu who, who uh, looks at the image of Hashem, Moshe Rabbeinu is Peh, Peh Adarba, who speaks face to face with Hashem, how can you speak about him? And the Torah says that Miriam was smitten with this disease, and just to digress for a second, Miriam wasn't um, just a regular person, and so Hashem judged her on a higher level than regular people. What she did on her level um, was out of concern for her brother, Moshe Rabbeinu, acting the way that she thought was, was uh, would have been better. And it was out of care and out of concern. Mo- Miriam wasn't only uh, someone who, as we'll see, did something uh, was very caring for Moshe Rabbeinu, but more than that, Miriam, Micha, talks about Miriam in this way. Micha says, Hashem took us out of Egypt with Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam. He puts Miriam in the same category as Moshe and Aaron. More than that, it says in the Talmud, the Miriam, when the Jewish people would travel, she was in front. More than that, the Gemara says that when Hashem spoke to Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu repeated his lesson to Aaron, right? Other text says this. The Talmud says that Moshe Rabbeinu repeated the first time, the first time after he got it from Hashem, who was the first one there? Aaron and Miriam. Mir- Aaron repeated to the men and Miriam mm-hmm. and women. Well, Moshe Rabbeinu repeated a second time to Aaron's children and to the elders, and, and then all the Jewish people hear from Moshe Rabbeinu directly. Different versions of of how the um, Torah was repeated. The Torah was repeated four times. It's also interesting if you notice in the Talmud, Rashi at the top of every page of the Talmud is four lines of Rashi, and the reason why there's four lines of Rashi is because a regular way of studying Torah is four times to study Torah at least four times to repeat it four times. So Moshe Rabbeinu repeated Torah four times to Aaron and Miriam, to Aaron's children, to the elders, all the Jewish people. It was a four-time repetition. So, but beyond that, um, Miriam was there the first time. So it just tells you who Miriam is. And therefore, the, um, the Talmud says, Hashem is medactic. The tzaddikim chodas Hashem is very, very careful with tzaddikim beyond what um, a normal person um, is judged. Hashem judges his attack far more severely. So, but be as it may, the Torah says that because Miriam was caring for Moshe Rabbeinu, so therefore Hashem lightened her sentence in the following way. When she got Saras, she got this disease, Hashem said she'll get this disease for seven days, a seven day period. And during that time, Hashem said the Jewish people should not travel for those seven days. Why shouldn't they travel? Because just like Miriam, when Moshe Rabbeinu was born, so the um, the Egyptians were scouting out all the Jewish homes to see if any Jewish boys were born. And they would right away throw the boys in the Nile River because the astrologers the Egyptians had seen that the um, the one who redeemed the Jewish people would be a male, would be a Jewish male, and therefore they wanted to throw all the boys in the Nile River. So when Moshe was born, they... Uh, 
the parents of Moshe Rabbeinu, Aaron, I'm sorry, uh, Amram and Yocheved, hid Moshe Rabbeinu for a few months. Moshe Rabbeinu was born early. He was born in the seventh month. So since he was born early, so the Egyptians uh, didn't know that um, Moshe Rabbeinu could possibly have born, been born so early. What happened was, was that Aaron, I'm sorry, uh, Amram, another, another, another thing that highlights the greatness of Miriam, when um, Paro made this decree to call the Jewish to kill all the Jewish boys. So Aaron, um, Amram famously separated from his wife because he said, "Why should we bring children in the world just to be killed?" And Miriam, his daughter, rebuked at two years old. She said to her father, hey, "Father, you are making a worse decree than Paro. Paro only made a decree against the Jewish boys. But if you separate from Mom, there won't be any Jewish girls either." Paro, his decree is only in this world. Your decree is in the next world too. Paro is a decree of human beings. Who knows if his decree will happen? But you, the leader of the Jewish people, your decree will for sure happen. You can't do this. And he, um, Baruch Hashem, listened to his daughter. And because of that, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was born seven months later. Uh, interestingly, um, when two months later, when when um, they could no longer hold Moshe Rabbeinu anymore, so Yocheved, Miriam's mother, Tafchal um, Pana. She tapped her on her face. I'm not sure. It sounded like a more of a stern tap than a light tap. I'm not sure exactly what the tap was like. But it was a tough chap. And now, she said, my daughter, where is your prophecy? Miriam was amazing. At the age of two years old, she was already having, having, already having prophecy. And her mother said, my daughter, where's your prophecy? Now we, we, we can't keep him at home. We have to put him in the Royal Nile River because we don't want the Egyptians to get to him. So then she sends Moshe Rabbein in a basket, famously in the Nile River. And Nile River is a place where all kinds of animals are, and anything can happen to him in that, in, the, in that basket. So the Torah says that when Moshe Rabbeinu was placed in the basket, Miriam stood at a distance, watching him. And because she stood at a distance, watching Moshe Rabbeinu, because of that, she merited, she waited for Moshe Rabbeinu to be discovered by, miraculously, by Paro's daughter, Basia, because of this, Miriam was rewarded, and all the Jewish people away to 3 million people. There were 600,000 men between the ages of 20 and 60, altogether about 3 million people. They all waited for a week for Miriam to have this, this, this disease to finish, and then to move on. And they didn't leave her there in the desert. That's what the Torah says. That's what the Talmud says. Why well, wasn't uh, they won't leave her alone? That's a good question. We'll get to that soon. Sure. So we'll get to that question soon. So... Um, so, the, but, but this idea is that Hashem rewarded her measure for measure. There was a woman; she was married with her husband for ten years. A night of her tenth anniversary, her husband comes home, and he goes to sleep, and she is very upset. Ten years they're married without children. A neighbor comes to visit them. A neighbor walks in. She sees she's sitting by the kitchen table. She's crying. I mean, there is a passage in the Talmud that says that after ten years of marriage. Um, and there's no children that the advice the Torah gives us to divorce. However, the consensus of poskim of Allah today is that that should not be done. However, um, she didn't think or suspect her husband would do that. But still, she, 10 years, and, and by their anniversary, she was very distraught. She was crying, sitting by the kitchen table. Her neighbor walked in. She sees, sees her there. She knew exactly why she was crying. She just turned around and walked out. And this lady, this, this, this wife, is thinking, what should I do? And she decided to do the following. She said, I'm going to go seek advice of a rabbi. I need to talk to someone. I need to talk to someone who, who's in touch with what goes on in heaven. She has been to many, many doctors. She had a whole, you know, huge medical file built up for why she can't have children. And she went to visit Hashem Zalman Erbach. She went at 10 o'clock at night. She knocked on his door. And Hashem Zalman answers the door himself. And she, and she tells him the story. She tells him, you know, we're married for 10 years. We want to have children. Why can everyone have a child except for me? She starts crying. Shem Zalman also started to cry. And he said to her, um, I want to tell you something, but I want, to take, I want you to take this in a, good, in a good way. She says, okay. He says to her, Hashem is not obligated to give you children. He's not obligated to give us anything. He's not obligated to give us health. He's not obligated to give us... He's not obligated. He doesn't have to do anything. That's what he told her. So she, she felt, you know, like a stone in her heart, and she turned away to go. She thought that was a message. Then he calls her back. Hashem is not obligated to give us anything. However, if a person goes out of his way 
and he helps other people, that he doesn't owe them anything, and he helps other people that, despite the fact he doesn't have any obligation to them, so Hashem does the same, and Hashem called Merachim and Merachim and Allah Hashemayim. Anyone who shows mercy to others, Hashem shows mercy to them. So she heard this, and she was very, she broke out crying, because she realized she had an answer. She had an answer. And she went the very next day to the hospital, she went to the maternity ward, and she took books and chocolates and and candies and just bringing joy to all these expecting mothers, new mothers, bringing happiness to them. And then she started thinking, you know, this the maternity ward is a pretty joyous word. People expecting good news. Hopefully, it's not with complications after show. But I, I want to bring joy. People who aren't so happy. She went higher up in the hospital. She went, you know, to places where there are people which are severe illnesses and not so happy. And she went there as well. And she went to children who were sick and old and older people and then she brought and she and she brought she brought everyone happiness, she made everyone smile, she bought them sweets and books and games and and she did and she did this and everyone blessed her. She said, Please bless me. Bless me that I have a child. And when the hospital blessed her. And and with it from the heart they blessed her. She did this and she married to the nine months later she had a she had she had a daughter. After her daughter was born, she didn't stop. She continued going to the hospital. She continued visiting the maternity ward and the other sections, the sixth and seventh floor of the hospital. And she did this for another two years. And she was blessed two years later to have twin boys. But she didn't stop. She kept them going. And she and she kept them going to this hospital. And her kids grow older. And every week, they go with her to the hospital. They give out candies and sweets and toys to everyone. And so you see this idea of Hashem responds to a person, shows rachim, shows so mercy, mercy to someone else, Hashem shows rachim. Call him rachim, rachim, rachim. Anyone who shows mercy, is shown mercy from Hashem. So, the question is, as, as Rabbi Shmuel was mentioning before, what was the other plan? Miriam had stayed with Moshe Rabbeinu, okay? And therefore, the Jewish people stayed with Miriam. Let's think about this for a second. First of all, it's a desert, Right? What are they going to do? How is she going to survive in the desert? Did they leave other people in the desert? <laughs> Number two, how old was she at this time? This time, Moshe bin was 81. How old is Miriam? 87. So she's 87 years old in the desert, and, and, and because she was kind to Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem was kind to her, and everyone didn't leave because, because she didn't leave Moshe bin. How does it make any sense? She's six years older than Moshe bin. Six, she was six years older. 87. So, so the answer is this. The answer is this. Of course, there was no plan to chas shalom put her life in danger. What the Torah means is this. The period of taras, the period of this disease, is a time when a person who has this disease is ritually impure. Because you're ritually impure, you can't go into the camp. In fact, in order for this this disease, which is a divine repercussion for this mistake of speaking ill about Moshe Rabbeinu, in order for this disease to have its appropriate sentencing time, the person has to be outside the camp. If there is no camp, then there is no, then you're not really outside the camp. You have to have a camp to be outside the camp. I remember a few years ago, the Rebbe told this gentleman that his, his father should get should check his film. His father had film. So they bought the film so they could check the film. So, so, so and Mark Hashem, that was a, a miraculous story in itself. Anyways, you know, this was Dr. Laz. You know, Dr. Laz? No, Dr. Laz. Yeah, Dr. Laz's father. Anyways, so, um, so what happens is, is that the Jewish people, if they would travel, there's no longer a camp. Since there's no longer a camp, the seven-day period wouldn't begin until they're, they're, they're all settled. If they did four days, and then they traveled, it would have to start all over again. It has to be a seven-day consecutive days. And when we travel, it wasn't with any particular rhyme or reason that we know of, meaning of, on this world. We went last Shabbos, the spiritual meaning of the travel in the desert, is a duklipa, but there was nothing about how they traveled that, that, that we could figure out how the system worked. If the clouds would go, we would follow the clouds. And so... There was, sometimes it was for just for a day, sometimes for two days, sometimes it was for a year, sometimes it was for 18 years. We never knew when the clouds were going to go. So, so because of um, Miriam's merit and waiting for Moshe Rabbeinu, 
Hashem said everyone should wait for her. So that way she shouldn't have to wait with the disease. If, if they would travel, the disease wouldn't, the period for the disease wouldn't begin. So therefore they stayed in place in order that her disease should begin and end in those seven days. So it's a very powerful thing because why is she married this first of all? First of all, why she married this because she stood with Moshe Rabbein. Why was she standing there? This week, uh, this gentleman called me up. It's not, not a secret, but I don't know if he wants me to announce it. That he Baruch Hashem, is on the way to have a, to become Jewish, and he had a circumcision. And he want and besides the fact that in order for the circumcision to be kosher, you have to have people there. But you know, it's just it's not something you want to go through by yourself. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, um, so the the idea of of being there with someone, carrying the burden, right? There's sometimes. You need someone to do something specific, right? And then someone just you just need to be with someone. And um, I notice this a lot, like my, myself. Like if I'm going with someone to visit whatever it is, to go to, to do whatever mission it is, whatever mitzvah it is, whatever whatever purpose it is, well, by myself, I I get I can get tired very quickly. Go with someone else, I don't get tired, huh? I work in the navy. Are you in the navy? Going going on a ship on on, on board. Yeah. To go with somebody. You have to go with someone on the ship. Yeah. As a rule of the Navy. Oh, two, two guys minimum. Two guys minimum on the ship. To walk on the ship. On the ship. On the main part. On the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the secure. You know? On the deck. On the deck. On the deck, yeah. You have to have two guys minimum. Minimum. Why? Because if one falls, the other guy is going to save him. Yeah, going to save him. Yeah. Oh. So, that's a, so that's what Miriam was standing there. You become a philosopher or something. Right? But with my children, I don't know if they go, they go with someone. Go with someone. Oh. So this is the idea of Miriam. What was Miriam standing there for? Why was she there? What was she accomplishing there? Moshe is in the back. She can't do anything. She was, why was she, she standing there? What would happen if she wasn't? She wouldn't have been there. She would have been there. So Yocheva would have, um, Basu would have discovered Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu wouldn't have wanted to nurse an Egyptian woman. And eventually, she would have figured out that is a Jewish baby and, and we need to try something else and, and we need to have Chol Yisrael, I need to call a Jewish mother instead to nurse Moshe Rabbeinu. That would have happened. But there would have been a little moment of anguish in between. I mean, moments of anguish for Moshe Rabbeinu as a baby, not being able to nurse. So by her standing there, she minimized his pain and lessened it for less time. But Miriam, it wasn't something she could have known. She was standing there just to be there with Moshe Rabbeinu. Because she was there, she was able to take away some of that, lessen the time of his angst as a baby uh, suffering. But the re- she, she, when Moshevin was in the basket, she was in the basket. Moshevin was moved by the ways, she was moved by the ways. The idea of carrying the burden with someone else isn't that you're actually doing something, it's that you're there with them. It's a very powerful thing. It's not something people can really recognize the value of it, because you can't measure it. It's something which is measurable. If someone needs you to help taking out the garbage, they help them take out the garbage. If someone needs you just to be there with them, it's a lot harder, especially in this Los Angeles uh, fast-paced uh, zone. Everyone, we have the LA virus. You know the LA virus? The virus is, bzz, what can you give me, what can you give me, what can you give me, what can you, what can you give me? That's LA virus. So um, without this virus, um, it's, if someone needs to do something specific, or begins, it ends, but the deal of just being there with someone, it's, it's a lot harder. Someone's, I mean, sometimes it's easier to understand. Someone's in the hospital, they don't want to be alone, but sometimes it's, it's more of a sensitive thing. And this is the power, the Torah says about Miriam, even though Hashem was, it's interesting, Hashem was thinking about her retribution for something she had done wrong, but at that time, the Talmud says at the time of Hashem gives retribution, also remembers their goodness. So at the same time, same as we do for other people, we're not we're always given the opportunity to stand next to a baby in the basket on, uh, on Nile River. But there are, everyone in our life could use more. They're hungry, maybe not hungry. They're hungry for attention, hungry for care, hungry for they're hungry, and just being there with them is something which is which is an infinite thing. It's not, and, and Hashem pays us back for this. It's something which Hashem responds to to us. For doing, it's not something which is measurable, and the reward is also not measurable. Hashem responds to us. I want to say that um, I read something this morning. I was leaving you guys with this amazing thing. What happens when um, you make dinner for your children? I don't have this experience because I don't make dinner. But you make dinner for your children, and they don't like dinner. The children don't like dinner. What do you do then? So uh, I, don't, I only, I only want to make two dishes. Um, and they make um, cereal milk and tradition soup. You know those ancient soups? And I put the hot water in. And tea, make tea also. Anyway, so so you're making dinner for your children and they complain. Why do you make this dinner? This is terrible. I hate this dinner, right? It's, it's a hard feeling. You, you work so hard for dinner and then... 
interesting, powerful teaching of Medit Shavit Rebbe. Amazing thing. This week's Torah portion we read about the manna bread. The Torah says the Jewish people were complaining about the manna bread. They were complaining about it. What does it say in the Torah? Hashem was upset. And it was bad in the eyes of Moshe Rabbeinu. It was bad in the eyes of Moses. On the surface, Moshe Rabbeinu was upset at the Jewish people. Why are you guys complaining? I'm taking care of you. We're giving this bread from heaven. It's so good. Why are you complaining? The Lady Litzel Medit said an amazing thing. Is what Hashem was upset about was that Moshe looked at them in a negative way. Why is he looking at them so bad? Why is Be'ene Moshe Ra? Why is Moshe looking at them down? If tells me in Ethics of Our Fathers, chapter 1, Mishnah 6, judge everyone favorably, judge every person favorably, and more it says, judge, look literally, the literal translation is, judge the whole person favorably. Call all them, the whole person favorably. Why do we look down at people? Because we look at the person's exact action, what they did, and we say, how could they do that? But if we would know where this person came from, if we would know their whole story, if we would know their background, if we know their challenges, if we would know their whole story, then we ought to feel that, then, then we would relate to them or know this wasn't something which was which which you could blame them for. So that's what Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, and that's what Hashem, sorry, Hashem um, rewarded Miriam with that because she at the same time Hashem is, is also punishing her. Hashem is also remembering at that same time that the the fact she stood there with Moshe Rabbeinu. So bottom line is. We need to, um, we have an opportunity every single day to be there for each other. And in more ways than one, just being there with someone is a huge thing. And this is how we bring Rachim from Hashem. And the world needs more Rachim. We need the Rachim, the coming Mashiach, the Karim Mamish. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's, just, let's decide tonight. To add, add a little more of a Rachim and Mechas in the world. Amen. And to bring more of our Rachim and Mechas to us. This is how we open the door of Hashem to us. Our Rachim to others brings Rachim upon ourselves. For all good. She said, "The Emes Rachim Deilim of Hashem redeeming all the hostages and bring the victory to our soldiers." Bekar Mamish Bias Mashiach Sakenim. Amen. Any questions or comments, criticism, tomatoes, cucumbers?